אוקיי, without further ado, מורן, אלישמע רני לנדאו, our project manager, and לאה ברי, who is our design lead, they will host the event. Thank you. Hi guys, hope you're all doing well. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Leah Burry, product design lead at, Immun at Immuni. Leah has a PhD in genetics from Cambridge University and did a postdoc in MIT and then crossed over to design through science art. And welcome Moran. Moran has a PhD in immunology from Hebrew University and has um, several years of experience working in the biotech industry. And we will be your hosts for this evening. Okay, so we're super excited to see a lot of people tonight, actually a lot more than we expected, which is also a little stressful for us, but we're fine. Um, and as um, Noah mentioned, we have a few really exciting talks um, tonight about, you'll hear about developing drugs, big data, machine learning, and our favorite or not so favorite virus at the moment, COVID-19. Okay. So we'll begin the evening with a talk by Professor Ido Amit from the Immunology Department at the Weizmann Institute of Science. Um, Professor Amit's lab pioneered single cell genomic technologies and their applications to characterize the immune system. His studies are being translated into innovative new targets for immunotherapy and autoimmune diseases, neurodegeneration, and cancer. So please welcome Professor Ido Amit. <clears throat> Toda, thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here and, and happy 2022. Um, so I thought I, and there's a lot of familiar faces which makes it even more fun. So I, I thought I'd uh, walk with you today and, and, and show some of how a single cell application can really change, transform how we're going to do medicine in the next 10 years. So <coughs> I think what we're going to see in this transformation is these huge uh, population scale uh, single cell uh, genomic measurement that we're starting to see, but they're going to get bigger and bigger. The pharma is going to get uh, into uh, such uh, studies into their uh, clinical trials more and more. There are some challenges. We can discuss them uh, if you wish. <coughs> but they're already uh, showing uh, a lot of uh, progress. We are starting to uh, understand using uh, a more and more sophisticated analysis the uh, different uh, breaking of the molecular feature with the uh, patient metadata <coughs> and importantly, uh, starting to harness this to uh, develop uh, better and better drugs and drugs that are more and more effective for the relevant uh, patients. <coughs> In uh, one uh, such uh, study I'm going to really uh, brief briefly uh, discuss with you, <coughs> we've looked at um, whether we can apply such uh, single cell uh, application into a, a clinical trial, in this one uh, specifically looking whether we can identify patients that are resistant or not resistant to first line and other lines of uh, multiple myeloma uh, treatments. And one of the most important lessons from, from this trial, which included only 40 patients, again, uh, relatively a uh, very small uh, clinical trial, is that it's all about the design. How actually are you designing uh, the samples that are going to be taken from the patient? How are you selecting the patient? And this is extremely going to be critical in everything we are going to do. In this case, <coughs> we took um, um, baseline uh, um, samples and along uh, every uh, third cycle from the patients and from the bone marrow as well as uh, from, from, the, from the blood. And these patients receive a new uh, combination at, at that point, uh, which is the KDAR clinical trial, which included the artumumab and, and other treatments. <coughs> the, the important thing that we learned, and I, I think you're, we're going to see more and, and more of, of this, so if you just uh, cluster or any way you, you try to uh, look at the uh, 
data of the different uh, patient in a naive uh, approach, uh, no matter how sophisticated the clustering al algorithm is, in this case it, it's Metacell, <coughs> we will see um, over here you have the uh, control healthy patient and these are uh, all of the uh, different uh, multiple myeloma patient. As you can see each uh, plasma cell uh, is basically clone is different, each patient is different from the other patients. <coughs> and one can very easily separate the um, plasma cells from the rest of the cells uh, with these markers, uh, separate the cancerous malignant uh, plasma cells from the healthy plasma cells with, with other markers. But wha what's important is actually that, sorry, that none of these approaches were um, good enough to separate the patients which are uh, resistant or not resistant to the treatment. Okay, so this is not, these, all of these approaches are not sufficient and that's also true when you're trying to look for can we identify the relevant uh, cells or the relevant targets for immunotherapy. These are very delicate signals that you, you don't catch unless you have a really good design of your animal model or your patient model. And if you look across, um, so these are the uh, healthy plasma cells market, if you look across the uh, malignant markers which are different across different patients. They don't break up between um, these uh, KDAR patients which are orange and these newly diagnosed patients. And remember these KDAR patients are resistant to the uh, first line treatment. That's why they're in the uh, KDAR. Basically if you look yeah. at these markers that are differentiating malignant and ma non-malignant cells, you'll not be able to characterize the responders and non-responder patient. For this you need much more uh, sensitive analysis and when we did do uh, this uh, more sensitive analysis what we found is there are uh, very uh, different pathways that are involved in the resistant uh, mechanism okay these had to do with uh, different genes which uh, could control the proteasome control a uh, different pathway uh, of the ER stress and so on and so forth among these genes, we found uh, several which are uh, very interesting drug candidates and continued through uh, genetic manipulation and small molecule manipulation. One of these genes is called PPIA, and what we showed is that these, this gene is upregulated in something like 30% of the uh, multiple myeloma patients, okay, 5% when they come into uh, the first line treatment, so 5% of patients are per start are going to be resistant uh, due to this gene. And as they get more and more treatments, the uh, gene is upregulated in, in more and more patients and more uh, of these patients become resistant to, the, uh, to these first line uh, treatment, proteasome treatments. And uh, manipulation either by small molecule or genetic manipulation of blocking uh, PPIA generates these cells and they become now sensitive to the uh, first line uh, treatment. So this was a first uh, study and I hope um, it's published. I, I thought I could go without any slides and you can check it. At any case, uh, what we found, and, and you have to trust me because there is no slide, <laughs> um, that in, in this case, currently we have I think only uh, around uh, 20 t uh, patients. We just started a year ago uh, working with them. That um, one can really break up um, the data of the patient that are responding and, and not responding by a very uh, uh, interesting biology. But what was really nice that one of the main biomarkers that came up is another uh, very important uh, gene that shuttles molecules from the nucleus in and out. And when it's overexpressed in patient, these patients are completely resistant to this drug. So it was amazing, with just 20 patients, we could really identify how their uh, molecule is working, what are biomarkers and how you might think about ways to uh, work around uh, um, the resistance uh, of these drugs. So um, this is the second uh, story, uh, which you have to trust me. I, I wanted this, at least the third story, it's a bit more uh, difficult to show without slide, <coughs> which is to think about and we can, we can open it to a discussion. So it's one thing to observe data, to observe uh, um, these uh, large databases and, and extract biomarkers and, and potential targets for targeting. But it's another uh, thing completely to 
<coughs> push forward um, the uh, experimental side, how do we prioritize these targets? How do we select, once we generate molecules, whether it's antibodies or small molecules which are effective, how do we prioritize such molecules? Where do we, uh, um, at the end, uh, um, decide to move forward with molecules which are more effective and, and, and really a uh, closed project of, of molecules that are not showing the potential we thought they would show? Yeah, we, we mentioned immunotherapy is really revolutionizing um, cancer treatment. You know, but the truth is, even in melanoma, many patients are not responding. We talked about this. We still there's still a lot we don't understand. Um, what we are trying to do is really think about how we can use single cell analysis and uh, sophisticated uh, an analytics to really change the entire way drugs are being developed from um, identifying uh, the molecules through uh, screening uh, these large uh, cohorts of patient in different stages uh, with and without uh, treatments and uh, using this to uh, later on uh, define or develop good uh, animal models and then uh, using these animal models to improve the uh, speed in which we develop molecules that are going to be effective or not effective. There are many decisions that one has to make <coughs> through clinical development and, and single cell analysis can do a lot to uh, help in that uh, development uh, uh, although there are many challenges. so. This is a, a study that we've uh, done with uh, uh, Ton Schumacher from the NKI and, and uh, Amos Tanai from the Weizmann, where we um, basically mapped all of the T cells across uh, melanoma patient. Um, what you see is basically uh, the many phenotypes. In this case, I think we're only mapping T cells which are specific to the tumors, and you can see they, they uh, have uh, many different uh, phenotypes. So T cell, when they get into the tumor, they see a a very new and different environment from what they've seen in the periphery. And due to that, they start to change. They activate the TCR that activates a specific signaling. In addition to the TCR signaling, they have all kinds of stress signals that are coming from the tumor, hypoxia, <coughs> and, uh, and, and, many, and, and many cell death and many others, which cause them at the end to be inactive, dysfunctional, exhausted. People gave it a different name. And what we try to understand, and, and then the uh, idea or the concept that was there for quite a while is that what PD-1 does, it takes these exhausted cells and revives them, makes them functional again. And we wanted to understand whether this is true, or maybe there are other explanations to how PD-1 works. Maybe it's touching on, on specific subpopulations. Maybe we can improve it by understanding exactly which population it actually works on. <coughs> to do this, Again, we developed this concept that while animal models are not reflecting the human biology, okay, you, like we have to understand it, it, you cannot mimic the the human tumors which develop over a long period of time with these uh, syngenetic models. Actually, any model that people say, oh, this is a great model. Models are just models. They're by and large wrong. But w what we do believe is if you understand the trajectory, the different population of cells and the trajectory of the different cells in the tumor, then your animal model can be a good avatar, can model actually what your molecule is doing. How does it uh, change okay, the effect of uh, the different biology? And then actually they, they come in very handy because immune cells are very dynamic. To try to do everything in patient is impossible. Uh, from some going to have a very hard time to get a good uh, biopsies in, in, in a relevant uh, time frame to understand the biology of the molecules, okay? <coughs> and animals allows you to do this, allows you to understand combination and, and so on and so forth. Again, if you understand the caveats and, and take them into consideration, and that's what we try to do. And this allows you to maybe think about how do we rationalize combination therapy. That's definitely going to be the direction that the field is going to take. PD-1 is great, but it's not sufficient. So how do we rationally add molecules? It's the amount of uh, uh, combination therapy is growing exponentially, but most of them are failing uh, miserably. Can we have actually a rational way of building this? <coughs> so we have many, we are approaching it in many different ways. I'll show you uh, in two slides one way. So <coughs> what you're seeing here are uh, T cells that are uh, only recognized 
tumor, they recognize the specific antigen that we uh, implanted in the uh, tumor. <coughs> here there, these uh, T cells are in the uh, periphery, lymph node, spleen, and here they're actually in the tumor. So you can see again, they have multiple phenotypes. The phenotypes are by and large similar to what we see in the patient. They're not a uh, big difference. There are some gene differences, but not population differences. And that now allows us to model really what is happening with PD-1. And when we do this, we, we see a very specific population that is actually modified by the addition of uh, PD-1. <coughs> we can then identify which molecules can be relevant as combination therapy with uh, PD-1. <coughs> and when we did this, now uh, we combine anti-PD-1 with this uh, new uh, target, and you can see that these two molecules, either PD-1 or this new molecule alone in this PD-1 non-responsive tumor line does not work. When you combine them, they do work. But what's more important to us is not if the, we, s we save the mouse, but we, if we actually understand what does it do in the T cell trajectory inside this harsh tumor environment. And what was very interesting that these molecules are working on, on different areas. So they <coughs> new molecule improves the amount of substrate that PD-1 can work on and, and really increase the efficacy of these uh, non-responding PD-1. So uh, I think this is a really a, a shows how one can do this and also very surprising again how gentle or delicate the effect of anti-PD-1 on, on a very specific subset of T-cell and the effect there are very small. If you just look at the data naively, you're never going to find uh, this data. It's not that you have a, a new metacell or a new cluster, okay? So very, very critical. Um, and it allowed us to do a lot of these studies uh, later on. Um, I think I'll stop here. I have a lot of new technology, but I, I think I'm going way over time. And I think to keep, so we don't stay till midnight, I, I think I'll stop here. And, and really uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to speak here. So I think there are many similarities to what your lab is doing at the Weizmann Institute and what Imena is doing. And I wanted to ask you about how you envision what will happen five years from now. Uh, and again, I, I can attest for all the remarkable discoveries that your lab is doing. <coughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. So wh what will happen five years from now? I, you know, I, I think we're s showing a remarkable increase in the amount of data, right? The cores are, are getting better. And on one hand, yeah, can you hear me or? Okay, so on, on one hand, the data is, is getting uh, bigger and, and therefore we could make a potentially a better prediction. On the other hand, um, because the data is getting bigger, sometimes the, the weaker signal is, is getting lost. So I think we're going to be really good at finding new targets or potentially new targets. But I think we're going to have a harder time unless we think about how to um, utilize different models to understand when we target these molecules what the what they are doing and how do we uh, generate effective combination therapies i think that's going to be the challenge i think the signal that the biologists are expecting are not there in the data so when you treat with anti pd1 let's say a, an amazing molecule right it's you know, a dream for any uh, drug development. So uh, maybe you can say to the audience, what, what did anti-PD-1 change in the, in the world? So, so anti-PD-1, um, for melanoma patient, I think it, it generated a, an amazing uh, change because many of them are, you know, coming into the hospital with, before PD-1, with a disease they are basically going to die in a very, in very in a few years, and many of them come not a small number, thirty percent or more, which are are coming out of the therapies healthy, and and the side effects are there, but they are uh, much more minimal than what we we had before with chemotherapy. The so problem this is, is this is so just to give uh, some of of you guys that uh, uh, we are living in a world where about thirty percent of melanoma patients, in including late stage stage three and four, are going to get. Essentially cured. cured. Essentially cured, right? And this is because of one of immunotherapy. And I just want to say that I guess that at least some portion of the audience doesn't really know what immunotherapies are. Do you want to give some uh, okay. explanation? Yeah. Uh, so immunotherapies are, are a molecule that uh, 
touch on uh, some parts of the immune system and uh, and that is their uh, therapeutic effect by you know in changing modifying uh, the I immunological activity you can think about them as cytokines that generate communication between cells or checkpoints which uh, uh, um, touch on the inhibition of uh, molecules of cells or, or other means so may maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say something a little bit dumbed down but uh, just to give a uh, flavor. So cancer cells, we don't really under fully understand, but they have this ability sometimes to kind of hypnotize the immune system and, and make our T cells and B cells less active. And those checkpoint uh, uh, inhibitors, uh, when successful, they're able to kind of turn on back our immune system. And uh, we don't fully understand, even not uh, uh, PD-1 or anti-PD-1, how it works, but we have let's say, growing confidence that this is uh, a game changer and we want to better understand it. And I think what you said initially was that uh, surfacing new targets for drugs, you can get, get them by the, by the gallon, right? You can get many, many targets. The question, what about, where is the next anti-PD-1 right. therapy? <coughs> right, so I think if you look, if you think about the history of, of uh, immunotherapy or checkpoints, you know, I in the beginning, people were laughed about suggesting the idea that this actually work. Until the early 2000s, I think people were um, very pessimistic about the effects of these molecules. It included both um, antibodies or, or CAR T cells and, and so on. And then there were the great success of, of PD-1, which on melanoma had a huge effect. Again, curing cancer is, is just a, an amazing uh, human feat. But ever since, I think we are in this uh, uh, limbo where we have this one amazing example of melanoma and with CAR T uh, that, that work really well on, on uh, hematological malignancies. But on the other hand, there is a lot of failures on, on all the uh, uh, rest of the development. And, and I think one thing we, we can do is bring data, bring knowledge that will allow us to now go into the non-responsive tumors, which are not very different at the end from melanoma. There are differences, but they're not uh, uh, significant difference. There is the same biology running in melanoma tumors and in breast tumors and in colon tumors or lung tumors that are not responding. And I think some of the, the, the differences are these m small differences that if you think about using um, the traditional immunological approach, like FOX, or other very crude uh, uh, ways to uh, uh, try to define the immune system are completely not relevant for, for the signals. And, and, and I'm telling you from really looking at a lot of data from uh, human and mice treated with anti-PD-1, the effects are very, very small. And that's the, the, the beauty about the immune system, the, the beginning, the, the decision making is in the beginning very, very small in, on a small subset of cells. And the effects are, are very tiny, not this explosion that people are, are waiting to look at this huge amounts of inflammation and going out, but this tiny change in a subset of cells, which then make the decision and, and, and modify the entire system. And I think you're, I you're describing something like uh, uh, um, even the butterfly effect or maybe domino effect where a small change starts creating a, a change in the entire immune system. And, uh, and I think that maybe in anti-PD-1 you see a more evident change, but it is likely in, and probably the, the conjecture that you and I have that the next big drug will not be so clearly evident like uh, some of the earlier cousins, uh, like CTR4 and PD-1. <coughs> Correct. So, the, so what we think is the next drugs will have to be something that works with PD-1. So PD-1 is a, is a wonderful molecule. Again, it, it affects a very specific uh, 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 area in the T cell trajectory. But for most of the tumors, this is not sufficient. They don't have sufficient amount of substrate for, for PD-1. And we have to bring data knowledge to understand for the rest of the patient, for the rest of the tumors, and it's not going to be one drug, it will have to be a few. How do we bring a sufficient substrate for PD-1 to work? How do we extend the uh, amount of efficacy that um, 
that is there already uh, inherently in the patient. So it's not that the patient, if we look at their T cell, all, no, not all, but a very significant amount of the uh, patient, both in, in, in lung or, or breast uh, or colon tumors, there is sufficient amount of T cells that recognize the, the tumor. It, that's not the problem. The problem is these T cells are right now not a good substrate for the immunotherapy drug we are using. So what is next in your mind? So I'm going to be biased here. No. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I, I think obviously we're not uh, uh, targe targeting uh, well enough the myeloid population and you know that's uh, something very close to my heart. Uh, I think that will make a very dramatic change. I think right now... Ma maybe give a few words about the myeloid compartment. Right. So, so I, I think we had a... Wait, you notice that it's a Czech therapeutic signal. Yeah, <coughs> yeah I'm, um, so uh, Noam made it, I think, uh, um, in advance. So I'm, you know, I, I, I think he prepared for this. But anyway, um, <coughs> yeah, so the immune system obviously is not a single uh, subset of, of cell that has, uh, you know, the, the, the magic bullet to solve uh, all of the uh, problems of cancer, or autoimmunity, and so on. But, but it actually is a, uh, is a interconnected system of multiple different cell types. <coughs> T cells are, are very dominant. They, they recognize the uh, ant tumor antigens or, or uh, other antigens and, and initiate a very uh, important response, whether it's effector response or, or a helper response. But there are the dendritic cells which are very important to present the antigens. And there are uh, various uh, other cells, uh, such as uh, macrophage and others, uh, T-regulatory no, cells. Not, not, don't worry, we continue. Okay. Wh which are, are playing a very dominant role in instructing uh, the rest of the immune system whether to uh, act, whether to initiate a, a, a response towards the foreign uh, uh, pathogen or, or uh, infected cell. <coughs> or uh, to, to stop the system and say, okay, th there is a, a over uh, activation here, we need to stop. And, and understanding these seasons and how do we block them or initiate them, I think is going to be really crucial. Thank you so much, Ido, for this insightful talk. And sorry about the technical difficulties. Our next speaker is Professor Iran Segal from the Department of Computer Science and Applied Mathematics at the Weizmann Institute of Science. In Israel, Professor Segal's group has extensive experience in machine learning, computational biology, and the analysis of high-throughput genomic data. Professor Segal has published over 120 scientific articles in leading peer-reviewed journal journals and has received several awards and honors for his work. He is also one of the top government advisors to the coronavirus cabinet. And he will honor us with a talk about personalized medicine based on deep human phenotyping. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay um, good evening, everybody. It's uh, nice that the presentation is working. Nice to be here and uh, speak in person and not about uh, corona. Um, so I'll tell you about a project we've been working on for uh, the past uh, four years in the lab. We call it the uh, human uh, phenotype project, and it's a, a innovation of um, um, really, I, I would say, about a, maybe a little bit over a decade ago, we did a major shift in the lab to start to work on projects involving uh, a human cores, and um, we've been involved in uh, multiple of these. The first large-scale one was one that we did on studying what healthy nutrition is, combining microbiome data um, with, with nutrition. Um, where we did a first study on 1,000 people that we recruited, connect, connected to continuous glucose monitors, profiled clinical data and microbiome data, and were able to show that um, there is personalized um, responses in terms of blood glucose levels when people eat the exact same food, develop an algorithm for that, and recently uh, completed a uh, clinical trial that we just uh, published in Diabetes Care showing that this algorithm uh, works much better on people with prediabetes compared to the standard of care diet. So when we finished this uh, project, um, the main development of the algorithm about uh, um, four or five years ago, uh, we thought that maybe we can take this approach um, to a much bigger scale. 
and, um, and work not just on nutrition and microbiome, but much, much more broadly on human cohorts and uh, health and disease. And, um, and I think the rationale behind this is that if you think about um, how much we've made progress recently, it's, uh, I think it's the case that if you have cancer today, you won't imagine trying to diagnose or treat it without doing a DNA sequence. Um, and I think that pretty soon, every disease is going to uh, be treated by using uh, multi-omic, much deeper uh, phenotyping data. And so our goal is uh, to really try and collect and organize the world's most deeply and largest uh, phenotype data. And uh, what I think this uh, will help us to address is this uh, major problem in drug discovery and development that uh, you can see here, where um, the cost of drug development has been growing exponentially in the past several decades. Uh, now it takes over 10 years to develop a new drug, 90% of them fail, it's billions of dollars. And if you look at um, pretty, you'll see that, uh, this is not, it seems that um, the curve has flattened somewhat by, um, some people think by the use of uh, genetics. So integrating human genetic data has helped us to, um, uh, to increase the, to increase the chances that uh, drugs will be successfully developed. And I think the way to break this curve is because genetics is just one type of data and it doesn't integrate environmental data, I think that by integrating uh, much more deeper multi-omic profiles, we'll be able to, uh, to greatly advance uh, drug discovery. And so what do I mean by this uh, deep phenotyping? Well, if you think about um, people when, uh, people who are young and healthy, we barely today have any health information about them. As people grow older, we start to collect more and more data about them. Uh, and maybe an uh, extreme example is uh, astronauts, that we have uh, a lot more data collected on them. But this is still uh, not a lot of data compared to what uh, we can collect. And this is what we're doing in, uh, in the human uh, phenotype project. So uh, this slide here shows uh, everything that we collect on a single person that uh, joins our study. And it's divided into uh, three main arms, uh, clinical and physiological data, molecular data, and samples that we biobank. So on the um, clinical assessment, when people come, uh, we obtain all of their historical blood tests, uh, everything they did in, in uh, their HMO, Kupat uh, They undergo an ultrasound to look at fat in their liver, to look at their uh, carotids. We have a DEXA machine that we do a full body scan and look at um, uh, bone density. Uh, EKG for the heart, uh, ABI, which also uh, measures the difference in blood pressure between the, um, the leg and the, uh, and the arm, uh, also state-of-the-art for cardiovascular disease assessment. We take a scan of the retina. Uh, we, we connect people to continuous glucose monitors, which allow us to assess their glucose metabolism. They go home with uh, sleep monitors that allow us to assess uh, continuously their sleep for two or three nights. Uh, we have all of their medication intake, they log their diets, uh, they fill out hundreds of uh, questionnaires about medical background um, and, and lifestyle, and we have all of their uh, medical diagnoses. Uh, in addition, uh, I believe we profile probably all of the omic data that can be profiled today, at least at very high throughput, and this includes uh, full genome sequencing that we do to people, microbiome assessment, both the oral and gut microbiome, uh, metabolomics from the blood, so we look at uh, tens of thousands of molecules that we can identify uh, in the blood. Uh, we have a novel immunological assay where we can synthesize hundreds of thousands of antigens and measure the, uh, what the antibody uh, repertoire of a person recognizes uh, from these hundreds of thousands of antigens, and we do uh, bulk RNA sequencing because that's what we can, uh, we can allow, uh, we can afford to do on uh, a very large cohort. And then in addition, uh, we worked very hard to develop a protocol that we store PBMCs so that we can freeze them and later do functional assays on them. Uh, we also bio biobank serum and pretty soon we're gonna biobank uh, urine. So, um, so this is what we collect and the first instance of this project uh, is what we call Project 10K. 10K for 10,000 people that uh, were on the verge of completing uh, their uh, recruitment. Um, and over time, we follow them longitudinally. What happens, and we're already seeing this, is that some of these people, when we recruit them and they're healthy, some remain 
as we follow up on them remain in their healthy state. Some progress towards developing disease and some uh, actually get new uh, diagnoses. And of course, it's interesting because we have their samples from before they were diagnosed when they were still uh, in their healthy state. So um, uh, in addition to this uh, uh, healthy cohort, um, we also have been working with clinicians to collect various uh, smaller disease cohorts in the cardiovascular state, uh, space, oncology, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and, and the vision uh, is, to, uh, is to be able to scale this up uh, soon to a much larger uh, cohort and to also encompass uh, many different uh, diseases. So, uh, so this, is what we, this is what we collect, and this is the, the vision. Now, of course, uh, what can we do with all of this uh, data? So uh, I'll try to give you a glimpse of uh, um, some of the applications and some of the discoveries we've, uh, we've been making. And so the way uh, I think about this is, uh, as I mentioned, we have these, uh, these layers of, of data consisting of the multi-omics, the biobanking, and the various clinical and physiological assessments. Uh, on top of that, we have the uh, analytics uh, to analyze this heterogeneous data. And then uh, on top of that, the multiple different uh, applications that uh, can, come out of, uh, can come out of this. So uh, the first one uh, I'll mention briefly is in the area of therapeutics. I believe that because we're collecting the most deeply phenotyped cohort where we have all of the multi-omic data profiled on the same people, we have the opportunity to develop, uh, to identify novel causative uh, biomarkers for disease that can lead to therapeutics. And I want to mention um, uh, one of them that uh, we are uh, actually actively developing, and this is uh, coming from uh, the microbiome. And so here, uh, uh, what you'll see in these uh, next slides are just a uh, kind of a stepwise uh, um, um, steps of, of uh, different uh, applications. This is for uh, developing live biotherapeutics, so live bacterial products that we'll want to uh, try to see if they can be therapeutic. And every time you see a, a green uh, a square here, it indicates that it's making use of the uh, large cohort that we have. And so the first step is that we're using, I'll show you in a moment how, we're using the cohort to identify bacterial strains at a very deep resolution that uh, can have therapeutic potential. Uh, then once we identify those strains, the advantage is that since we own the cohort and this is, these are uh, participants that we actually recruited, we can go back to individuals who we think harbor therapeutic strains. We can take a sample from them isolate the relevant bacteria, and then we go into a process of uh, development where we'd like to uh, GMP formulate these bacteria and then test them in clinical trial, which if successful would lead to novel um, biotherapeutic products. Uh, and so uh, the approach uh, that we're taking is because we have this very uh, large scale data set consisting of thousands of individuals, then uh, we can for the first time not just look at the composition of bacteria, so not just which species of bacteria are present in various samples like we and others in the field of the microbiome have been working on, but really go down to a much deeper resolution. And this is the resolution of single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, SNPs, much like you analyze the only way in which you analyze the human genome, but nobody has done this for bacteria yet because the cohorts were too small. And uh, when we do that, um, Basically, we, we map this variation uh, at every single nucleotide, at every bacteria, and then we associate that with traits. In this case, I'm showing the association with BMI. And uh, when we do that, what's, um, what was very surprising is that the strength of signals that we're identifying are actually much stronger than the signals you identify in human genetics. And this is even though we're looking at 8,000 samples compared to hundreds and even millions of samples that people have been looking at in human genetics. Just the signals are much stronger. So this is a standard Manhattan plot, except that these are not human chromosomes. These are bacterial genes. And every dot represents a bacterial SNP. And so uh, here's, um, uh, here's uh, another way to look at this data. This is a volcano plot, where now you're seeing on the x-axis the effect size. So how many points of BMI are statistically explained by each bacterial SNP. And you can see that some SNPs are explaining one or two points of BMI. This is huge. This can be five 
or 10 kilograms of body weight. It's larger than the strongest signals that we see in human genetics. So uh, another uh, area that we think we can use the data for is for companion diagnostics. So what's the idea here? Here we know that uh, although there's a lot of uh, very successful drugs, especially in the field of cancer, that uh, really did not exist and, and are now uh, showing amazing results, they still, in many cases, only work on a small subset of people, 20, 30 percent of people. So uh, in that case, we can uh, go into these clinical trials, either trials that were done or trials that are done prospectively, and uh, look at the group that are responders and non-responders to the drug. And typically, if you only compare uh, responders and non-responders, you'll have a very small set that you're comparing one to the other. It'll typically also have many differences, like the age distribution of these two groups may be different. So any differences that you may find may also be confounded by all of these other factors. So the ability to have this very large uh, scale healthy cohort allows us to take the responders, find for them matched controls, matched healthy controls in our cohort, people who are with the same age, same gender, and same uh, blood test or BMI, whatever we, we want to, uh, to match on, and then find biomarkers that are common to these drug responders that are appearing in these drug responders when we compare them to uh, uh, um, the matched healthy cohort. And similarly, we can do that for non-responders, and uh, we believe this will be an approach to allow us to look at very robust uh, biomarkers because typically when we do this matching, because our cohort consists of thousands of people compared to dozens, uh, and to best case, uh, hundreds of uh, responders and non-responders, we typically can match 10 to one. So for each, each patient, match 10 healthy cohorts, and, and by that, identify robust uh, dr um, uh, uh, biomarkers. And, and uh, we've, uh, we've done that uh, also in, in one example in multiple sclerosis, uh, Tecfidera, a drug by uh, Biogen where we've identified gut bacterial biomarkers that separate responders and uh, non-responders. Um, okay, another uh, uh, area, similar uh, but somewhat different, is to find robust uh, biomarkers of diseases. So here, uh, we don't have responders and non-responders. We have people who have a certain disease. But again, the idea would be to match them to a much larger set of healthy controls matched on age, gender, whatever we want to match on, and find uh, robust uh, disease biomarkers. And here, uh, working with our various um, disease cohorts that I mentioned before, we've identified uh, biomarkers for uh, several different diseases. I want to give you uh, some examples, a paper that uh, we have in press now, um, looking at acute coronary syndrome patients, so people who underwent a heart attack. And the idea here is uh, that we can do an analysis even on a single patient. So imagine that we have a single patient who had a heart attack, uh, and we have our very large cohort of healthy people. What we can do is we can find matched healthy controls specific for this, uh, for this patient, matched by uh, age, gender, and BMI. So take a 60-year-old male who had a heart attack, find 60-year-old males uh, in our cohort, and then look at different layers of data. For example, look at our metabolomic data. And we can then ask, uh, uh, and, and we can then search for metabolites that appear in the blood of our patient, but are very different from his specific reference group. And, and the reference group, of course, would be different for different people. So, um, uh, so uh, when we do that, uh, we can do that for uh, multiple different, uh, we can do that for one metabolite, we can do it for all of the uh, different, uh, different metabolites. And using our cohort, we can also then ask what controls these different, um, what controls these different metabolites because we can compare them and see which metabolites are driven by diet, which by microbiome, which by genetics, to tell us these disruptions that we see in people are they a result of uh, maybe a bad diet, bad genetics, or bad bacteria, which would also allow us to know how, what is the optimal way to, uh, to treat uh, these patients, and we find many personalized differences. Yeah, I, so. I think just I'll mention this uh, immune assay because I think that's super interesting. Uh, we have the ability to synthesize hundreds of thousands of antigens, and then with phage display, we can take antibodies from the blood of a person and with sequencing at the end, in a high-throughput experiment, we can uh, measure 
what out of all these th hundreds of thousands of antigens the antibodies of a single person uh, recognize and when we do that uh, we can find um, we can find food allergies we can find the entire infectious history of a person uh, we can um, we can separate very easily uh, for example Crohn's disease patients or IBD patients or uh, uh, people with uh, celiac disease so uh, I think it's a very powerful uh, cohort that uh, we're combining uh, with all of this yeah I was uh, I'm always uh, optimistic and I'll just say that uh, I think I hope you I hope I gave you a glimpse of uh, the type of multiomic data that we're collecting and the great potential that we see for it uh, in terms of uh, being able to develop novel diagnostics, therapeutics, uh, integrate that in the uh, disease discovery process, uh, which I think uh, can make a um, big difference. Um, and as I mentioned, we're, uh, already, uh, we've already been collecting um, uh, a lot of data. And I'll just put uh, the final slide of uh, my group of wonderful students, postdoc, coordinators, lab technicians, and um, thank you. Okay, thanks, Iran, for this um, amazing, cool, impressive talk, and we're looking forward to reading your next 120, 50 papers. Um, so the next talk is going to be, um, Noam is going to come back onto the stage and tell us a bit about um, something that's very close to all our hearts, which is Immuni. Um, in case you don't know, which I don't know why you're here, Noam is um, the CEO and co-founder of Immuni. Um, and um, Noam doesn't have 120 papers, but he has 120 uh, degrees. Um, Noam has a double PhD in math and computer science. Um, and he did his postdoctoral research at MIT um, and at the Center of Mathematical Sciences okay, and Applications at Harvard <laughs> University. He also did a lot of other things, and he's going to tell us about Immunite. Thanks, Leah. Um, okay, so thanks, first of all, to uh, Ido Amit and Eran Segal for really insightful and wonderful talks, and I apologize for the technical difficulties, but I think it was a good demonstration of what we have to endure in a startup, always uh, be improvising and as I will soon show, uh, always be fundraising. Uh, do we have it, or <laughs> I need to improvise? Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, our mission uh, at Immuni is to uh, decode the human immune system, and I actually think that in some sense what we are doing is very similar, uh, some combination of what Ido Amit described and what uh, Eran Segal described. We are trying to fully map the human immune system and build uh, the largest uh, relevant data set for the human immune system. Maybe I'll wait another. Okay, I'll, I'll start uh, because I've given some uh, pitches. So the immune system is, uh, is incredibly complex and it, invo it involves every, uh, um, almost every disease and health state that you will have from prenatal to uh, childhood to uh, aging and eventually to uh, dying. We all cope with uh, um, in, some, in some sort of uh, or another, I coped with COVID-19 and some of you, I guess also, some of us had to uh, cope with more serious uh, things like cancer and autoimmunity. Uh, some of us deal with uh, obesity or mental health situations and all of them are somehow related to inflammation in the human immune system. And, um, and one of the questions is, can we better understand the human immune system and what should we do in order to understand it better? And I want to say that when we started about uh, three and a half years ago, one of the, the things that people said to us was that the human immune system is infinitely complex. How many people in this uh, room are mathematicians? So it depends what you mean by infinite, but even mathematicians like to count different types of in inf Okay, thank you, finally. So I, I don't need to give a talk about uh, Cantor. <laughs> But uh, the immune system is incredibly complex for sure. Uh, thank you. So, going back to decoding the immune system for better therapeutics. Here are some of the indications that we all have to deal with. The opportunity in this space is remarkable. So, eight of the 11 best-selling drugs are immune-centric. And in fact, the top four drugs in 2021 are immune regulators when the leader is as you all know, uh, due to uh, Pfizer and Moderna, or to Biontech and Moderna, 
that made over 50 billion dollars in 2021. And you can see how I transformed from, from being an MIT and Harvard to being a CEO. I count dollars and you see uh, there are 100 billion dollars in 2021 by the four leading drugs. So this is the opportunity, but the problem is that uh, developing drugs is hard. Like uh, Iran, Iran mentioned, it is hard, but the question, and I think I have similar numbers, but not quite the same, depending on where you count the, the probabilities, but over $2 billion to get a drug to the market, more than 10 times, sometimes even 15 years um, in R&D, and between 90 and 95% failure rates. Our mission in Immuni is to map and reprogram the human immune system. The challenge, as I mentioned, is the immune system is incredibly complex, and our approach is to combine best-in-class single-cell immunomics with machine learning and AI. And I saw that there are a few mathematicians, but how many software engineers or other types of engineers are in the audience? Okay, so not, not bad. So we'll talk a lot about engineering, and I think Immuni is an engineering-first uh, biotechnology company. We put a lot of emphasis on creating uh, a big data infrastructure for our platform. So some of the accomplishments, we started uh, in December of 2018, uh, about three years ago. We have, with our partners, uh, 10 peer-reviewed publications. We actually have over 100 partnerships, but 30 of them are substantial, including with some of the institutions that are here, with Ichilov and the Weizmann Institute and, and many others. We uh, were fortunate enough to raise uh, almost uh, $300 million to date, and we have a growing team. Now it's close to 140. Uh, many of them are PhDs, but the ones that are not PhDs usually have a, an impressive background. They were either Intel Piot, or in Shmone uh, Matayim, A200, or, uh, or just smart people. So PhDs is not the only thing that is important. Our headquarters and wet lab is in New York City. We have offices. The engineering uh, center is in Tel Aviv. We have other centers in, in the Bay Area, in Zurich, and in Prague. I'm going to go very briefly because I was asked. We were a little bit uh, behind schedule. So I'm going to go briefly about uh, reviewing the platform that we have built. Um, how many people understand what they see here in the picture? Just raise your hands, more or less. Not the employees of him. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a U-map. It is a, a, a two-dimensional projection of the space of uh, our measurements, single-cell measurements of cells, of immune cells. What you see here is a, a bunch of uh, cells from 100, about 100 uh, cancer patients, um, CD8 cells, CD4 cells, different types of B cells, different types of monocytes, but you see that we can go uh, to a fine-grained resolution. So uh, cell types or cell states that are very difficult to uh, annotate consistently, we are able to do, and we are able to do it because we leverage multi-omic single-cell uh, sequencing together with machine learning. So for those of you who, da who do have the background in biology, we measure multiple so it, it is multi-omic, it is a different type of multi-omic measurement. We are not measuring um, microbiota, but we are measuring different assays uh, within a cell, uh, starting with the RNA that you probably all heard. Uh, but we also measure the TCR or BCR sequencing data, if it's a T cell or B cell. We measure over 200 surface proteins. We measure sometimes the epigenome with a taxic, and we also do functional genomics, and we can measure CRISPR perturbations. Now, this data is being integrated with uh, computational methods, and supported by machine learning analytics, we can get, like, as I showed, to a very fine-grained annotation, and then we do uh, a bunch of um, interesting downstream analysis. So differential expression analysis, uh, transfer learning to uh, get multi-core meta-analysis, and also causal inference. I'm not going to go over this uh, cohort, but we have many, many different cohorts in our database. So this is an example of a cohort with one million immune cells. Uh, we were mostly interested in CD8 T cells. We have 30 metastatic melanoma patients, two different uh, treatment arms, and two time points. And those cohorts are being fed into the database that we call Amica. Amica is a name uh, standing for Annotated Multiomic Immune Cell Atlas. And we have Amica Prime, and Amica Prime is all the partnerships that I described. So we have about 30-something uh, uh, proprietary partnerships that we have with hospitals. We generated about 15 million cells, and, and it, 
keeps growing, but we also have access to thousands of uh, uh, studies. Uh, so about six months ago, we announced the acquisition of a Swiss company called Nebion. Nebion uh, existed uh, since 2004, and they have curated essentially all the bulk RNA sequencing data out there, and they've been also doing the same for single cell sequencing data. Why is it so meaningful? So again, going back to what Iran mentioned, when you have a lot of data, you can start doing some interesting and, and uh, impressive uh, things with it. So the Amica, the, the atlas that we have, together with different types of models, in this case, uh, a convolutional neural network uh, um, architecture to mine the data, we are able to, um, let me see if I can do it. Mm. I'm not sure, but look at the right hand side. You see that we are able to get a much, much better detection of doublets, and we reduced the mistakes in annotation by 90%. And we can also get about twice more cell types and other best in class uh, methods. So I explained very quickly the two. Uh, um, the thing on the left and the thing on the middle, but the goal is to get immunological insights, and there are three different types of uh, insights that we generate in Immuni. The first one is the target identification and evaluation, so that goes back to what Ido talked about. Being able to surface targets for new drugs is something that we do very often. We also couple it with immune mechanism identification. So that means that we are trying to understand how a drug actually works on our human immune system. And fi finally, we are validating and augmenting known therapies and new ones. So what you see here is a sort of a magical circle where we have, at the center of the circle, we have Amica, our database, our clinical genomic atlas. But below and above, you see two different types of data sets feeding in. in. The one above is the patient atlas that I described. So different patients go to hospitals, they go to therapies, they give different measurements, blood samples, peripheral blood, and tissues, and we do the sequencing and we put into Amica. The other type of uh, measurement is what is called multiomic CRISPR perturbation, where we do genetic editing of cells. And why is it important to also do the genetic editing of cells? It provides you the what if. So you know how patients look like, but you want to know what if I change this gene in this cell? Is it going to be better or worse? And we have in the database both CRISPR perturbation data as well as in vitro uh, disease model data that we have for actual patients. And we feed the database, and I'll give an example, uh, both disease and biology specific signatures as well as uh, prioritized targets. So I'm, I'm sorry for those of you that are not familiar with this. It may be a bit te technical, but uh, I will go a little bit into the details very quickly. Here is an example for what the platform can do. So initially, we start with certain primary human T cells, and we do CRISPR perturbations. So CRISPR perturbation is a certain way to do genetic editing of the cells to, to see what happens downstream of that. OK? So here, you see that there is disease immunology and relevant in vitro models. What does it mean? We want to see how different patients, for example, pancreatic cancer patient and breast cancer patient, how they behave. And so what we do is recapitulate the biology of cancer in vitro, in the lab. And then we do the experiments and we generate, let me see if I can still try to, it's too complicated for me. Uh, what you see on the right hand side is different genetic signatures. So there are two different main uh, types of, CDs, um, of T cells, CD4 and CD8. And what we do is genetically edit, in this case, knock out different genes like PD1 or LEG3, and we create a genetic signature of this knockout. And then we take a bet on specific signatures, and then in our database in Amica, we start doing the computational in silico analysis and evaluation. And eventually we can enrich for specific disease indications. So let's say that we really care about pancreatic cancer. We are able to measure the commonalities and the differences in the specific disease models. And this is an example that is a little bit like doing an SQL or like querying a database with specific 
signatures that we care about. So for example, in this case, you see that we care about immune cell specific phenotype, for example, CD18 naive in responder to anti-PD1, and we also want to compare this to how IBD signature look like. This is on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, we can really narrow it even further by trying different uh, genetic knockout, the perturbation data. So eventually what you see is a, is a mega uh, database that can cope with different types of signatures and find matching. So this was very high level an example for our platform, which is you know, big data and AI and all the fancy words, but a lot of engineering infrastructure is being put uh, to good use. I remind you, if I didn't say it before, every even peripheral blood sample is a terabyte of information. So if we're talking about 10K uh, samples, we're talking about huge, huge uh, data sets, and we plan to get to hundreds and thousands uh, of patients. So now I'm going to go back. So this was a little bit technical. I'm going to go back and explain what is, from a business perspective, what is differentiated about Immuni. So this is a little bit of history. So some of you may even work in Google or Microsoft or, God forbid, Amazon or Facebook. And, uh, and you know that those uh, companies have built their livelihood and became very uh, large by building a very strong engineering infrastructure. And they tried, but they couldn't go and get into uh, biology. And the reason is that they lack the scientific and therapeutics expertise, and they don't have access to the key opinion leaders and the regulatory authorities. So it was too difficult for them. On the other hand side, there are companies like Pfizer or Roche or J&J and others that know a thing or two about therapeutics, but they don't have the DNA of engineering, and it's very difficult to build it, this in-house. So initially, I will confess, when we started, I didn't realize that it was so difficult to change a pharma company from within. So it's much easier to do what companies like us are doing, which is to build a new company from the beginning to be a hybrid that on one hand brings engineering as the, as the core infrastructure, and on the other hand brings uh, medical doctor, doctors, immunologists, biologists. And there are many companies, immunized differentiated by being the only engineering first big data company with immunology focus and single cell sequencing resolution. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Noam. Um, so I hope you've been wowed by this presentation. Uh, I know I have, and I, s you know, I've I've been working in this company for over a year, but I'm still wowed. Um, so really, what does it mean to to work at Immuni? Um, to give you a little glimpse, we we've assembled an employee panel uh, with some members of our different teams with different backgrounds um, to show you a little bit of the multidisciplinary uh, nature of our of our group. So please welcome uh, Shaked Afik. Yeah. Shaked has been a member of the Computational Biology Guild at Immuni for over a year, year and a half. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley, where he worked in the lab of Professor Nir Yosef, working on uncovering gene regulation mechanisms in the immune system and developing methods for the analysis of single cell data. And please welcome Chiara Weingarten. Um, so Chiara is the Director of Operations and Project Management. Um, Chiara has an undergraduate degree in biology from MIT, and she spent a big part of her studies in both the computer science department and in cancer research. She joined Immuni as one of our earliest employees in April 2019. And since joining Immuni, Chiara has been working at the intersection of different disciplines in the organization, ensuring executional excellence, in the way that Immuni works, interacts, and achieves defined goals. And finally, give a warm welcome to Raviv Prailuk. Yeah. Raviv Prailuk is our VP of Operations and the head of Target Discovery, Validation, and Evaluation R&D Group. Uh, Raviv holds a PhD in computational neuroscience from Weizmann and an MSc in engineering from the Technion, Technion Institute of Technology. 
Raviv was also a technological leader and commander in the Israel military intelligence and led to many accomplishments on that front. Um, one sec. Please also welcome Merav Meluban. She's the head of marketing at Viola Ventures, one of Israel's leading uh, venture capitals and an early investor at Immuni, of Immuni. So uh, please go ahead with the panel. Thank you. Wow. Hi guys. Hello everyone. So nice to be here. It was amazing so far. So um, thanks Noam for the invitation to speak and um, for the amazing presentation. So as told, I'm head of marketing at uh, Viola Ventures. So just uh, a word about Viola. Viola is the uh, um, is an early stage um, fund. Uh, we are part of the Viola Group, and we are early investors in Immuni. Um, so anyone who is building anything in uh, deep tech and computational biology, please talk to us. Uh, recommendations by Noam. <laughs> so. Uh, we wanted to share some light about what does it mean to, uh, um, to work at a computational biology company. So we have three members of Immuni here with us. So Shaked, Kiara, and Yuval, welcome, and thanks. Um, you all come from very uh, different and diverse backgrounds, so maybe we'll start by you presenting yourself. Here you go. Hi, so uh, my name is uh, Shaked and I'm a computational biologist at Immuni. Um, as uh, Moran already mentioned, I received my PhD from UC Berkeley where I worked in uh, near Yosef's lab and I worked on gene regulation mechanisms in the human immune system and the method for development for single cell data. So I think that the leap to Immuni was not, uh, was not that huge. Uh, and I, uh, so I joined Immuni uh, a year and a half ago uh, so I'm not from the founders' generation, but I I came on pretty pretty early. Great, um, yeah. And so I'll expand a bit on the introduction that uh, Leah and Moran gave. So um, I I joined Amy and I pretty early on. So the story goes that you know after I graduated from MIT, I uh, moved to Israel. I did a short time at the at the Knesset at the Parliament. And um, shortly after I was here, I received uh, an email from uh, Lewis uh, talking about you know, the, the start of uh, a company that really integrates computer science and biology. And that was a really nice fit for me because that was precisely what I had done in my undergrad. Um, Basically, that's the same route from Professor Gamsu, right? From, poli from politics to, uh, to medical. <laughs> <laughs> in a smaller scale, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, but yeah, and, and so I, I joined, uh, you know, basically with uh, um, w wanting to just contribute to, uh, to a team that was already amazing, even though it was uh, quite small. Um, and now it, it's obviously expanded a bunch, and so, and so has, you know, all of the impact that we do. And so I'm very excited to be sharing some of that insight with all of you. So, as was mentioned, my background is, is mixed. Uh, I did my BSc and MSc in engineering, and then I switched uh, in the PhD to computation and neuroscience. But uh, I'll actually tell uh, how I get to, to work at Immuna. So, it's funny, but I was introduced to, to Norm and Lewis uh, through Viola. Um, and, and actually, I was in the route of, uh, of serving in, in the intelligence community. and. Uh, obviously, I was very uh, devoted to, to serving the country, but uh, actually Noam uh, was able to convince me that uh, serving the country is important, but actually serving humanity is much more important. <laughs> so, uh, wow, that's what a dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's what I chose. <laughs> Great, so uh, let's kick off with you, uh, Kiara. Uh, so, as I said, Imina is a very um, multidisciplinary company. And you have people from uh, ML and uh, software uh, to biology and immunology. So maybe you can say something about how do all of these functions work together? I mean, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities for people who want to work in such a company? Uh, yeah, and so this is a good question, I guess, for me specifically, since I'm, uh, it's really like in the core of w what I'm trying to do, getting uh, all of the different functions and, and efforts in the company to align towards that one mutual goal. And so. 
I think that the main thing to say is, you know, the, the structure of the company and the way that we're working towards goals are, are multidisciplinary in, it, in itself. Um, and so we have, we have teams that are made up of, of, of people that come from very different backgrounds. Um, with, with, uh, with the core understanding that no problem that we're tackling is defined to one particular discipline. Um, and, and actually, I, I always joke, like um, every time that I, for example, when I'm talking to Lewis about, uh, um, about some idea or some project that we're about to execute, he always goes, okay, but why don't we run this by this software engineer? Why don't we run this by this machine learning engineer or, or this immunologist? And it's really like an understanding that um, every problem that, that we're trying to tackle, every problem that we're trying to, to solve, um, a, another person w from another background can come to it with another angle um, and really amplify the solution and, and improve the, the way that we're thinking about, uh, about that. Um, I think a, another component is that, you know, definitely as we build this type of structure, it's, it's true that lines do get blurred. Um, so it, it is sometimes a little difficult, you know, to differentiate, okay, but what is this software engineer versus this machine learning engineer doing? How does, how does that differentiate from the computational biologist? But I think this is a benefit, right? Um, if, if we were to have like very distinct lines that differentiate different, different disciplines, then it w we have the risk of um, like allowing things to fall through the cracks. So the fact that as people join, they, they really um, end up understanding and even delving into other disciplines is what enables us to, to grow and succeed as a company. Um, I'll touch a bit because you asked about the t challenges, so I don't want to ignore that. Um, definitely, you know, there, there are challenges involved as uh, people that come from different backgrounds have to work together um, and, and align on that uh, aligned uh, goal. And I think maybe the, the main challenge is that we're growing really quickly and this is a culture that we have to build and it's a culture that we have to maintain within the organization. So having people join um, at such speed and ramping them up to this culture and, uh, and, and onboarding everybody to be aligned on the way that we work is a challenge, but uh, definitely one that we're working towards, uh, towards implementing. Right, so continue the, uh, uh, this thought, maybe for the ML and software people in the audience, how um, can they add value to a company which is you know, basically a biology company? So maybe Raviv. Yeah, so, so I think I'll, I'll give a concrete example. So uh, I guess that uh, everyone in the audience that uh, work at the front of uh, machine learning and software engineer is familiar with the transfer learning uh, approach. And, and actually it was funny because when uh, um, uh, great engineers at the company w were looking at the uh, immunology problem, they were acknowledging the fact that actually what was implemented very successfully in the vision front is a great fit to what happens in immunology. So in, in a very... Uh, a quick overview, so uh, in immunology you have genes and then you have cells and then you have maybe phenotypes and eventually it goes all the way until the, the patient and whether it responds or not responds to, to treatment or, or to anything else. And, and if you think about this uh, structure, it's layered structure that is very uh, similar to what we have in the neural nets or in the uh, network in general that, uh, that we are very familiar in the, in the vision and in other fronts. And when the machine learning at the company looked at the problem and first uh, f um, form it in a similar to other problems, so it gives new insight and new perspective to, to the problem, but also it gives uh, uh, new solutions that uh, other cannot uh, 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 tackle. Uh, and I think uh, Ido Amit mentioned the, the fact that, uh, you know, PD-1, for example, uh, uh, is very successful, but the next uh, round of, of uh, treatments and, and drugs won't come for very brute force uh, approaches. So we need to have very uh, delicate and fine-tuned approaches and machine learning, uh, transfer learning, and, and uh, various approaches there are great fit for that. And, and uh, we find a lot of uh, uh, common ground between immunology and, and, uh, and machine learning. So, Shaked, maybe you can um, uh, give a couple of examples of how machine learning uh, has brought significant value to questions in biology. Yeah, so um, I think that uh, at least uh, here in Imunai, one of the great advantages of the 
Machine learning is that it's really truly integrated in all the steps of our platform, and it starts from the initial steps of characterizing what is what is good data, what is high quality cells, what is what is doublets, what is uh, negative cells, and so forth. It goes to uh, how you classify cells into the different cell types, which is obviously a very crucial aspect if you really want to uh, truly be able to have a high granular granularity and and be able to get significant insights. Uh, and it also comes, I think, to like what what many of us would think more is like the more like general and like um, uh, cool questions of machine learning is like can we can we really like predict response to to treatment, for example. Um, and I also think that another advantage um, here at here at Immuni is that the hypotheses that are generated by machine learning, because we also have the lab, we can actually very easily and very quickly test them and actually both use it to fine tune th the models but also then to later test the hypothesis that they are generating. Right, amazing. Um, Kiara, back to you. Um, so Imini has a big and maybe even ambitious uh, vision. Like Noam used to say, you know, uh, building the ways for the immune system. Um, so what made you believe that this, um, uh, the the company can solve this uh, amazing problem, a very complex problem. Um, yeah, so I think you know Noam in in the talk just now finished with like the differentiated technology that we have uh, in the company, but I, and so I, I won't focus on that. Um, you know we have uh, of course like single cell technologies and, and machine learning and all of that. I think w one one aspect that you know I've learned in my in my time at Immuna is that. Um, we're, we're quite systematic about um, like what we know and what we don't know um, at any given at any given problem at any at any given state, and so I think what what makes us stand out and enables us to succeed is the fact that we are we are very clearly um, acknowledging what it is that at the moment we don't know, and then we recruit the the right people and the right technologies in order to actually um, resolve that unknown. So I think it's 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 incredible for me, um, you know, the the way in which we're we identify that we need to implement some new technology. So we bring aboard, you know, the the person that is spearheading that technology, and and whenever we we have questions on a on a very specific niche in biology, we're able to um, get the advice and the insights from these uh, these people, and you know, of course, uh, our our board members and and all of the advisors that we have to to contribute to this as well. I think it's um, you know, it it really amplifies towards you know, in addition to all of the technology that we work to implement. Yeah, definitely. Team, board, and management, uh, um, uh, you have an amazing, uh, uh, you know, from each of them. I have a question for you, Raviv. Um, so, you know, us as a VC, we, are, we always, you know, look at the companies and we look at if they keep up with the KPIs. So my question for you is like, you know, every tech company has a very clear KPIs to know if, you know, they are on the right path to success. So how do you measure success in a biotech company? So... Like everything in the army, I would divide my answer to three parts. Um, <laughs> so, so I think that the, the first component is that uh, you have to have trust because at the end of the day, the only way to measure is whether we were able to cure patients and that's why we are here. We want to cure patients. And obviously it takes time. There's a lot of regulations and the processes are very complex. So the, the proof is in the pudding and we would prove that we are uh, right only when we would cure patients and, and we would do it. Uh, sooner rather than later. But, but so you need to have trust. The second component is um, like the analogy with, with the kitchen or with the chef. You need to, to have, uh, you know, to smell that the right things are happening in the kitchen and you need to see the right uh, tools. So in general, you need to, to see that there are the right people and the right uh, uh, culture and a lot of the other things. But I don't want to avoid the, 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 the core of the, the question. So we definitely implement a lot of uh, other processes that uh, are in any other uh, serious organization. So we are working based on the OKR uh, system. So we have objectives and key results. So every quarter we are sitting together, both top down and bottom up, and we are defining what are the milestones that we want to achieve. And we measure ourselves uh, uh, around these uh, OKRs. And, uh, and obviously we are doing a lot of retro. So 
Uh, for me, it was uh, trivial to, to do retros or tahkirim as, as in the army. But, but definitely, we are keep questioning ourselves whether we are uh, heading the right direction. And, and we are startup, as you saw uh, Noam uh, just uh, demonstrating it uh, here uh, an hour ago. We are changing and, and responding all the time. It's not that we have you know, a plan that we came uh, five years ago and we are just executing, and that's the fun. The fun is that uh, each one of us can bring a lot of uh, you know, uh, his personal uh, uh, flavor and experience and capability, and we can change uh, the reality every day. So that's what makes it uh, fun. Definitely the nature of a startup. So Shaked, you come from the academy. What's the difference between um, a daily research experience in industry and academy? Uh, well, I would say f maybe the, the most, uh, the, the biggest difference is the collaborative en environment. And again, so I joined UNI straight out of grad school, so I only have an N of one, mm -hmm. so I can't speak to the entire industry. Um, but um, as also as, as Kia mentioned before, bec the because it's so interdisciplinary, then you always, when you tackle a problem, you always tackle it with multi ang with different angles, and you need to work with people from different um, that come from different backgrounds and have different point of view. And at the end, it ca it uh, I think the the output is, is is much better, but it does take some uh, some getting used to. Uh, and but that's like also in addition to being interdisciplinary, at f like in in grad school when you have a project, you're probably the only computational biologist working on it. Well, here we have, a, we have a team of computational biologists where we all have our own project, but there's a big overlap. So definitely when you think of like writing code and developing a tool, you think of it as like this is something that I know that in a month uh, one of my fellow teammates will, will be using. So it's a different mindset. Um, and from a different point of view, I would say that the, um, the timelines and the way that we structure projects is different. There's definitely less time. Completely to do different. Yeah, okay. there's definitely less time to do uh, exploratory analysis, uh, and you are you try to stay more focused uh, as much as possible. Um, and and I would say that even though like the deadlines are are tighter and like sometimes you have to do something fairly quickly, uh, still I am not nearly as stressed out about that as I was near my qualifying exam. So like it's still. Even though the deadlines are tighter, I'm definitely less stressed than academia. But how do you translate biological questions into computational biology? Maybe elaborate a little bit about that. Uh, well, that's most of my degree, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the entire field of computational biology, where uh, I think the data that we're generating is also built in a way that you get it, and it's, um, it, it's fit a format that's easy to look at in a computational computational way. So like I think you can follow out of like statistical models that are that takes into account like the biological properties, but also they rely heavily on math and statistics and it's just how we structure uh, both the data that we are generating but also how we look at it and how we analyze it. Great. So um, we're coming to the end of the panel, so let's uh, do um, like uh, a lightning round. So short answer from each. So let's start. Um, where do you see Imunai in five years? Uh, getting very close to a uh, first proof of concept for the work. So hopefully in five years, I think we we will have uh, drugs uh, mm -hmm. in the market, and uh, <laughs> you know we'll already be accomplishing what Raviva uh, just mentioned as our ultimate goal, which is to, to no pressure of it. <laughs> um, <so laughs> I think I, I stole your answer. Probably. I already cured uh, many patients around the world, and uh, on the way of becoming the largest uh, pharma tech company in the world. Amen. Um, Will single cell technologies become the standard in medical research? Uh, more so, yes. You know, you don't have to de to, to agree on anything. You need you, you can disagree. You can fight on the in the panel. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, like single, people will continue to identify the value in single cell technologies. 
Um, but I think it's fair to say that, you know, there's, there's other technologies that I'm sure we will continue to discover and will continue to, 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 to build up and definitely uh, integrate into our toolbox. So definitely single cell technologies will continue to, to expand, but I, 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 I'm not sure as to whether that will truly be the only technology that we have um, and that we'll continue to expand in that regard because we'll, we'll hop on to whatever other new technology comes about and hopefully that we'll, we'll discover and pursue as well. I think that fortunately and unfortunately, um, it takes time to, to people to acknowledge great things. So I think that also here uh, would uh, utilize the fact that uh, a lot of people still are not acknowledging the fact that this is the future, uh, but eventually, uh, yes. Right, so... Last question, a very relevant one, because she's marking me, we have no time left. So, office or remote? Uh, hybrid. Uh, three days in the office, two days remote. So, I, I, I like the office. I was actually, um, I, I live 15 minute walk from the office. Uh, I like having lunch with my coworkers, so I'll, I vote for office. Uh, if not, I get too lonely. <laughs> We would kill COVID, so office. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Thank you very much, guys. And thank you all. OK, so thanks to a great panel and really interesting questions. And if you guys in the audience have more questions, then you can just catch one of them or other immunites over a drink afterwards. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're excited to uh, uh, Professor Ronny Gantz, who has been the CEO of the Tel Aviv Surasky Center since 2015. Um, he also, is kind of the theme of the evening is a super impressive CV, so um, I'll just go over it quickly. Um, He's a professor for gyne um, gynecology and associate professor in public health and health and business administration from Tel Aviv University. Um, professor Gamsu holds, in addition to an MD, a PhD degree in health science research and two master's degrees in business and health administration, as well as a bachelor's degree in law. Um, in 2010, Professor Gamsu was appointed as the director general of the Israeli Ministry of Health, where he served for four years. And then in 2020, he was appointed as the Coronavirus Project Coordinator. So welcome, Rani. Yeah, but the smartest guys in the room are you, and not really the one with the degrees. So thank you very much for the presentation and uh, for inviting me to speak here. And uh, Really, it's incredible because I, I was looking for physicians in the crowd and for, for medical doctors in the crowd and I believe that there are almost none. One here, okay. We are a minority. Another three or four and we are trying to solve the most complex case or the most complex issue in uh, physiology, in pathology, in you know, in neurology, and we are doing that with with data scientists, with uh, AI specialists, with computer scientists, and uh, really, this is uh, the way to go, in my view. And you know, I'm heading a, a very intense, a very acute care hospital. Uh, very large, if you take that uh, on international terms, the Tel Aviv Medical Center, Ichilov, is one of the largest uh, in the Western world. Uh, and we understand more and more that uh, although we are a very high-end technology-based hospital, and we believe that we are giving the best uh, uh, medical care, we are doing that with tools that belong to the past. And do we want to look ahead and to do what, we, uh, what you are doing here. You know, you have here, uh, as I say, mathematicians, statisticians, data scientists, biologists, uh, chemists, physicists, 
uh, medical uh, doctors, uh, and we are doing uh, what uh, what we are calling uh, sciences convergence. We are taking all sciences together and 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 cutting off the silos, because really science is one. I was uh, a very curious uh, student when I started. Uh, uh, studying medicine and understood that uh, really it's a good way to understand clinical science but I have to look for uh, many other tools in order to go ahead and curiosity leads you to ways in order to solve many many problems many many issues uh, then I joined a, a, a group and did my PhD trying to solve an issue with, with uh, reproduction, human reproduction, male reproduction, never mind that. But this is what pushes us ahead, trying to solve the very complex issues of medicine, because it's really complex. And in order to do that, you have to go down, deep down, into the cell, into understand how the cell function, understand the molecules. Of course, genomics, proteomics, lipidomics, go to the basic structures of the cell function, understand that, and then go up to the clinical sciences. Because what we are doing now, we are trying to, be, uh, to do our best, but really, in medicine, we are not doing a very precise and precision-wise medical care. I, just for, for you to understand, uh, a physician going to a world, uh, to a morning round in the ICU in, in the Tel Aviv Medical Center in Ichilov, he has to go through around 20 beds. Uh, in any bed, there is a patient in the ICU who has a continuous monitoring for many parameters. You, you know, around 20, more than that. A continuous monitoring, and he's doing a round, he has, let's say, 20 minutes on any patient. In 20 minutes, he has to understand and to analyze and to comprehend and to do the, uh, uh, the analytics of huge amount of data. And he is, uh, and I'm giving him the, you know, this, I'm surfacing him a very, you know, average kind of data, which is blood pressure, ventilation, uh, pass, saturation, uh, ECG, maybe other things. And this is not going into the cell function and not going into the tissue function. And he's analyzing that in 20 minutes. He really don't, do not analyze that. He doesn't have the ability to have a, a real analytic power in his mind to combine all these parameters and to say whether we are going into sepsis whether this medication is really doing some benefit to the patient. So on the average, he has some, some experience. Just take, for example, a resident, a second year resident who doesn't have that experience. He has some kind of clinical sense. Sense. It's not really the precision medicine that we want to go ahead for. We want a better kind of precise care and he's doing some kind of, of, you know, an average analytics. He has his tools, but we are lagging behind. To be honest, other industries, not as important as healthcare, are ahead of us. You know what? Commerce and retail are ahead of us. Transportation, ahead of us. Agritech, agriculture, ahead of us. Many other industries are ahead of us, even uh, auto tech industry and you name it. And why is that? Why healthcare, medical care, hospitals are lagging behind? Why they are not going into the complexity yet? Yes, it's very complex, but doing, uh, you know, autonomous uh, riding or, 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 or riding a car in an autonomous way, auto tech, is as complex as that. Why is medicine and healthcare is lagging behind? Because we do not have this convergence of sciences. 
physicians are ahead, physicians and biologists and immunologists are too dominant. They do not bring in within our system data analysts, mathematicians, statisticians. I was this morning on a meeting with the president of Tel Aviv University. Here, are the here is the Tel Aviv University, and on the, and the other side is Ichilov, is Tel Aviv Medical Center. Joining hands, rarely joining hands. They have the best, you know, faculties, the best academic power, um, data analysts, but joining hands with physicians, with our, you know, best researchers, it happens rarely. This is why medicine is lacking behind. And when you are trying to understand why is, you know, the, the, the culture of, of medicine is the way that physician grasp his, his role. He is the leader. Uh, he can solve the problem. He will solve the problem. But it's changing now. The culture is changing and immunity is part of the change because you are working within one of the toughest challenges in, uh, in medicine, in clinical, uh, in clinical medicine, is immunology. Trying to tackle and to understand how can we success or succeed better in understanding what is the immune cell, whether a T cell is one T cell, we know that is more than that. And how can we influence, how can we manipulate the T cells, the B cells, and all the immune system in order to fight diseases. And the common ground is that immune response, immune cell, really is related to many diseases, I would say all diseases. Any disease, you know, you name it, as inflammation. A lot of the diseases have a reaction, a body reaction. The body reaction usually, almost all the time, involves the immune system. So whether it's cancer, whether it's heart attack, whether it's, you know, neurodegenerative diseases, autoimmune diseases. Now I've already talked about more than half of the diseases or half of the pathologies that we encounter. So tackling the immune system and going within it to the cells, to the molecules, to the genomics, to the proteomics is the way to go. So the first time that Noam explained to me what immunity is all about, I was impressed and I was really uh, into that and understanding that you are going in the right way. And we have to understand that we can bring the future and we can bring a revolution in medicine. It takes first to understand that we are going into the complexity in order to solve uh, and, and to succeed in, uh, you know, in, uh, in entrepreneurship or in solving uh, the clinical uh, 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 challenges that we have, we have to go into the complexities. We cannot surface up and trying to find, okay, this kind of a molecule, let's see if it's work. No, we have to engineer the molecules. We have to understand to do the... Uh, uh, the engineering, the, the, the biology, and then understand how it's going to influence the cell. Go into the complexity. Try to understand, try to, to analyze the genomics, the proteomics, and then go ahead and try to manipulate and, and uh, direct the cells, the immune system, into the right di direction. This is one thing that we should do in order to uh, accomplish success. The second thing is what we are doing here, what you are doing here. Converging capabilities, uh, training, uh, sciences all together. This is the only way to go. The people that are from biology, uh, mathematics, statistics, physics, engineering, 
all of that together in order to build a molecule, in order to understand the change that an Omicron uh, uh, variant of, of Corona is going to cause, what's the clinical relevance of such a change? You have to understand computational biology, engineering biology, to converge sciences. Sciences, science is altogether one. We have to bring it all about and to go ahead. The third key, key point is to speak and to align the physician on your side. It's tough. It's real tough because they are skeptical. They believe that you will not have the answer. They used to have the answer. They want to know what's within the black box. You have an algorithm, an AI algorithm. You want to say, this is the way to go. Go within the algorithm. It will let us understand how the cell function, how we, we can manipulate the cell. They want to go within the black box. They want to go with, you know, sometimes it's regulation, IRB committees, FDA. We have to find ways to bypass that and to gain the trust. The gain, the trust of the physician is a very important, very important step ahead. And the fourth one is to understand what we are doing. Go and be next to the patient. You know, I'm speaking to physicians, to students, to interns, to residents, to nurses that are students. And the most important thing that, uh, that makes them unite in Ichilov, in my hospital, is the fact that we are changing life. We are, we are in the sacred place of treating a disease. You, immunized, has to get closer to the patient to really understand the, the diseases, the suffering, in order to be proud of what you are doing, to be proud of, of the way that you are trying or, or, or the task that you have taken. And this, in my view, are the four key factors that we need, in, you need in order to succeed. Again, go into the complexity, you are doing that within the cells, go into the genomics, go within the proteomics, try to understand how you can manipulate the complex function of the cell, identify the cell, and this is what you are doing. Do convergence of all sciences, be in touch with the physicians, and understand patient and disease because this is really the goal that you are aiming at, and for me is a very important one, a sacred one uh, to go. So more or less, this is my speech. Thank you very much. You are wonderful. Thank you, Roni. I want to say that uh, Roni Gamzu and Imuna is now sitting very close uh, to Roni's office. Uh, Roni said, uh, mi casa, su casa, and we are actually working very closely with Ichilov. I completely agree that there should be a, a not only a dialogue, but a true partnership between physicians and uh, biological and mathemat mathematical researchers, and that's what we are doing in Immunai. Uh, I, I want to thank all the speakers. Thank you, Roni, and uh, before also to Iran and Ido. Thank you guys very much. Uh, again, I wanted to thank Amit for organizing this for Lea and Moran for uh, you know, uh, leading us and hosting this event, and for you to, uh, for joining. There is one uh, thing that I didn't, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, mention again, and it is uh, actually related to what something that Chiara said and reminded me. I think Chiara was the only one uh, without a PhD that presented here today, but she's probably the smartest one of them all. Um, and she said something very important about our, our culture. So uh, immunized culture is not about knowing, it's about asking questions. So I think admitting that we don't know, I it is the fundamental uh, uh, or the, the basic step that can lead to answering complicated questions. When we started, 
uh, we admitted we knew, I knew nothing about the problem. I was lucky to be a, a mathematician, a little bit naive about the complexity of the problem. Probably I wouldn't have started otherwise. It seemed, okay, you just need to map the human immune system. How complicated can it be? It can be complicated, but then uh, with our amazing uh, scientific founders, we were able to keep asking the right questions and bringing the people that are going to help us think better about the problems and implement new technologies into the company. So I think asking the right questions is the, you know, the, I think the meta research tool that I am following since I was uh, a child or when, since I started doing research, um, I think the convergence of sciences along with asking questions is the, uh, you know, the true anti-dogma that can lead to solving very complicated questions and to every one of the immunites uh, in the audience and listening to us from um, New York, San Francisco, uh, Zurich and Prague, I want to thank. And for every one of you that are not yet part of Immuni, I invite you to uh, reach out to uh, our, re <laughs> our recruiters and uh, we'll be happy to, uh, to interview you. Thank you very much.